So next we have uh, Dr. Bree Dow. So she, um, she's with a DVM and PhD here. Uh, she got an MPH here at the University of Tennessee. Um, and she was working on the project that Dr. Marcy Souza and Dr. Adam Wilcox had talked about before with Bushmeat. So we're gonna look at her presentation today, um, talking about some of those aspects in her research. Um, and she considers herself that she's an epidemiologist and veterinarian whose research interests include surveillance and mitigation strategies uh, for neglected tropical diseases and social and biological factors facilitating emergence of zoonotic infections. She currently serves as an adjunct lecturer of epidemiology here at the University of Tennessee Department of Public Health and as the communicable disease team lead in zoonotics for the Seattle King County Department of Health, a recent switch for her, which is good news. So um, without further ado, we will get this presentation started. All right, good morning to everyone attending the UT One Health Day Seminar 2020, and thank you for tuning into this session this afternoon. Um, as Dr. Hardman noted, my name is Dr. Bridal. Um, I'm going to be talking to you today about some findings from my PhD research, um, looking specifically at social factors um, relating to the bushmeat trade and bacterial microbial diversity um, in that bushmeat trade in northern Uganda, and some of the implications that it has for human infection. And so, as you all are probably acutely aware by now, the issue of emerging zoonotic transboundary pathogens, although it's been garnering a lot of media attention in recent years, is not a new public health threat. Between the years 1940 and 2008, um, 335 newly identified infections were described just between those years. And of those, over 60% of these emerging infectious diseases were zoonotic in nature, meaning transmissible between animals and people. Additionally, over 71% of these zoonotic EID emerging infectious disease events uh, were caused by pathogens that were of wildlife origin. Um, and some examples of that that we see in the media and in the past decade are things like the Marburg cases um, in Uganda, Marburg disease virus in Uganda, the huge plague outbreak um, in Madagascar in 2017, the recently sort of attenuated Ebola epidemic um, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and of course our ongoing coronavirus pandemic. Um, and so the number of in emerging infectious diseases caused by pathogens originating from wildlife have been found to have significantly increased over time, even controlling the reporting effort. And so we know that contact with these wildlife poses a significant health threat. So when we dive into the human wildlife interface and hunting, which is going to be the topic of our talk today, we know based on historical patterns, um, and human activities that, that human development continues to encroach into historical wildlife habitat. Um, and this is sort of related to population increases and the need for sustainable food sources and space, um, even in, you know, different outside of Uganda and even in Uganda, recreational activities. Um, so things like ecotourism, hunting, um, running, climbing. Um, and, and even well-intentioned conservation activities. And this increased contact facilitates increasing routes of human exposure to potentially zoonotic pathogens, both from direct contact with these wildlife and from the environment. Furthermore, as wildlife become more concentrated spatially, both in captivity like these live markets um, that we have sort of come into the global awareness and in shrinking protected areas, out in the wild, um, microbiota, um, these those microbiota that are pathogenic and those otherwise th sort of thought to be commensal and non-pathogenic become more concentrated. And this greater concentration increases the likelihood that there will be a spillover event into human populations. Furthermore, although viral zoonoses tend to be higher profile in the cases of these epidemics or pandemics, most of the recognized tropical diseases are parasitic and bacterial infections. And these infections tend to simmer in populations globally. And 
Although they don't receive the same media attention that these big viral outbreaks cause, they cause devastating economic and public health outcomes for the populations and individuals that are affected by these NTDs. And so now more than ever, there's a need to better understand the biologic and sociocultural drivers of zoonotic pathogenic emergence in order to sort of better mitigate the effects of these events. And so the topic of today's talk, bushmeat, um, when we talk about bushmeat, it's generally defined as the muscle and organ tissue derived from hunted wildlife. And the term bushmeat is generally reserved for wildlife that is hunting, wildlife hunting that is illegal or unregulated, either in methodology, in the target species, um, the areas from which the animals are being hunted, or being hunted at unsustainable levels. And in most areas, bushmeat is utilized for personal consumption um, to fulfill dietary needs or is sold in market to supplement household income directly. Now, bushmeat hunting is prevalent throughout the tropics and subtropics, and increased dependence on bushmeat tends to correlate with areas that have greater biodiversity in species, wildlife species. Now, these areas of greater biodiversity also tend to correlate with levels of higher poverty and higher food insecurity. And the accessibility of a free or an expensive protein source for households living near protected areas where wildlife tend to be abundant have created a dependence upon bushmeat for nutritional and financial security. Although bushmeat remains local to the areas that it is hunting in many instances, increasing population movement from rural areas into urban areas or cities has brought with it increased urban demand um, and has now created a supply chain for transporting bushmeat from these rural into urban areas. And with bushmeat travels its microbiota, for better or worse, even potentially crossing borders. And so bushmeat hunting and various processing activities in the bushmeat trade also pose a concern for pathogenic exposure to those involved in the bushmeat trade. And this is a particular public health issue because many of the communities are in which we're sort of studying bushmeat are already financially stressed, may not have reliable access to health care um, and treatment, um, and also consequently sort of um, decreased infrastructure for reporting these infections. And activities related to the bushmeat trade include hunting, butchering, transport, cooking, and consumption. And all of these inherently provide multiple exposure routes, whether we're talking about contact with pathogens, say bacteria, viruses, uh, parasites on the pelts, respiratory droplets um, from contact during hunting or even butchering if the animal is fully intact at that point, um, salivary excretions of the animal, bloodborne exposure, particularly in high risk or high injury risk activities like hunting or trapping or butchering where you're in close contact with not only just a wild animal but oftentimes a wounded animal. And while we're already concerned about infections sort of endogenous to these wild animals, there's an additional layer of concern regarding biological hazards like environmental contaminants, spoilage associated microbiota um, that sort of threaten individual infections. Um, as much bushmeat is harvested and butchered under these suboptimal hygienic conditions and often stored with inadequate cold storage, which leads to spoilage um, sort of allows for picking up of pathogens that may not necessarily be endogenous to the wildlife, but so are then introduced into this sort of consumption chain through environmental contamination. Now in Uganda, our study area, the hunting of wildlife is expressly illegal. Um, this country relies heavily on ecotourism for many of its avenues of income. However, there is the exception of removal of designated vermin species under the supervision of the Uganda Wildlife Authority. And those vermin species are baboons, vervet monkeys, and bush pigs. And so because of the illegality of the wildlife trade in Uganda, the bushmeat trade consists of person-to-person -person transactions rather than these sort of open markets with free choice 
carcasses laid out um, that, that tend to be more familiar in media images. And in northern Uganda, just north of Murchison Falls National Park, wildlife that have been typically framed and implicated in zoonotic pathogen emergence, so things like bats and non-human primates, are not commonly preferred for consumption. They're not um, preferred types of bushmeat. It's not sort of taboo to consume these um, species. And so in theory, this should really confer a degree of cultural immunity from infection with these diseases that we associate with these species because in theory, they're not being consumed. However, our work in Uganda um, has sort of brought up the concept of species deception um, in market where species are being sold as species that they actually are not. And so we'll discuss this um, in, in sort of its implications. And so this along with the sort of current global health, public health crisis sort of necessitates the need to identify pathogenic risk from these common wildlife reservoirs and understand the bacterial microbiota of bushmeat to prevent these infections as well as the social drivers um, of emergence of these infections. Because as we sort of know now, especially now from this pandemic, social behaviors greatly influence the persistence of these infections within populations. And even within populations, but certainly human actions have really important implications for prevention, even in the contact from, from these wildlife species. And so between the years 2016 and 2017, we'll sort of touch on the social science first. We interviewed 180 self-identified hunters in one-on-one -on -one interviews and 292 um, female cooks on either one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one -on -one interviewed. And the survey that we deployed in the field contained questions about meat preference, perceived risk of injury and disease during activities involving bushmeat, knowledge of zoonotic diseases, availability of species and market, and of course, some demographic information. And so these were conducted um, sort of over three-week periods in each of the years 2016 and 2017. And I'll just touch on some of the highlights of these findings. There are quite a few findings. Um, but the first that we were really interested in was, was there a degree of awareness in the community of zoonotic infections, and specifically zoonotic infections that could be acquired from wildlife? And so we asked about quite a few diseases. These are sort of the, um, the ones that were most striking. So we asked about in, in this data, Marburg virus, Ebola virus, which were both found in the area and sort of, um, at least in the case of Ebola virus, highly publicized. Stomach ache and diarrhea, sort of getting at the idea of um, foodborne illness and enteric disease. Monkeypox, another really, really big name, highly publicized zoonotic infection um, that not only has these sporadic spillover events, but sort of is thought to have established itself um, in, in sort of a permanent crossover event. Brucellosis, um, which sort of should have a great degree of awareness because of veterinary interventions in the area um, for um, wildlife and livestock um, and vaccination clinics, and then scabies, which actually came up again and again in our interviews. And what we actually found was that there was a higher than expected degree of awareness, particularly um, for, for the women, the cooks, the female cooks in the area. Um, so the, the women that are taking in the bushmeat from the hunters or the dealers and then preparing it for their families. And this zoonotic potential awareness was the highest overall for stomach ache and diarrhea, so our proxy for enteric diseases, followed by monkeypox and then actually by brucellosis. Both hunters and cooks had a high degree of awareness for Ebola virus. There was relatively few people that responded to sort of associating Marburg virus with zoonotic potential, especially from a wildlife reservoir, um, which is interesting um, because in Uganda is where we're seeing these sporadic cases of, um, of Marburg disease virus popping up. Now, we also asked a question about, the, so for the hunters and for the cooks, about their perceived likelihood of different wildlife species carrying diseases, wildlife and um, livestock, so animal species, carrying diseases that humans are able to catch. And then we did a factor analysis dimension reduction 
on those data and to see where they sort of fell as far as people's responses. And what's interesting about this data is that for hunters, they very clearly, the way that they responded, very clearly grouped baboons and bats together as sort of the highest risk. And so these, um, these values that you're sort of seeing, the, we sort of rank these on a scale, how likely are, is this particular animal to carry a disease that humans can catch, one being not likely, um, five being most likely. And so the higher the mean, the more likely it is to carry a zoonotic illness. And you can see that like clearly bats and primates were grouped together in hunters and in the and in the female cooks actually all of the um primates that we asked about sort of grouped together very clearly in this sort of red block on the right what was interesting and sort of unexpected is that we sort of thought that the the way that this would go is that baboons, monkeys, all these sort of high risk quote unquote wildlife would group the highest followed by other wildlife followed by domestic species. And for both hunters and for cooks, they actually perceived the next sort of highest tier risk sort of showed by this, these yellow blocks came from domestic species and that other wildlife, so things that are commonly consumed like antelopes, bush pigs, hippos, other things in the field, bush rats, um, they found that, or sort of reported those as being the least likely to be carrying diseases that human can catch, even less so than domestic wildlife, which is interesting, an interesting finding, not one that we expected, but likely comes from, again, these continual education campaigns from um, Gulu and Noya district veterinarians uh, for these vaccination campaigns. And so they're likely very educated on these um, diseases of livestock that can come from wildlife. Um, and so just the awareness of them being able to carry these diseases has sort of upped that. But the groupings here are very interesting where even though we don't commonly consume and perhaps because we were one of the reasons that they, you know, people in these communities in Noya district don't consume um, primates and bats commonly um, is because of this perceived zoonotic risk. We asked both hunters and cooks what precautionary measures or whether they took precautionary measures when handling meat from animals. The hunters and the cooks overwhelmingly said no. When we're handling, preparing, cooking, butchering, tissue from wildlife, definitely no. Um, I think there were two responses from hunters that said, yes, I take precautions, but those precautions were actually to discard the bones of um, the bones of the species that they are handling so that they don't get um, caught and prosecuted for harvesting wildlife, not actually uh, disease risk preventative measures. When we asked um, the cooks that question, we still had overwhelmingly, no, we don't take any precautionary measures when handling tissue from animals. But again, what's really interesting is that more often they took sort of safety precautions like washing their hands or making sure that the meat is browned or blackened when preparing meat from domestic animals rather than bush meat, which again sort of bolsters this perception that other than things like bats and um, primates, that, that wildlife tends to be safer in general than domestic species. And our last finding that we'll sort of go over from these, um, from these social science, so social science data, um, we asked sort of touching back on this idea of species deception market where hunters and dealers are disguising um, sort of higher risk bushmeat as another kind of bushmeat. We asked both hunters and cooks how often they thought that primate meat was disguised as another type of bushmeat in market. Overwhelmingly, the women reported no, that never happens. A few women reported, hey, sometimes that might happen in market. Um, but, the, but the vast majority, as you can see, sort of on these yellow bars, report that they never thought that that happened in market, that what they're buying is what the dealers say it is, and what the dealers say it is, is what the actual tissue type is. Whereas when we look at these really striking bars in green here, we can see that the hunters report that hunters and dealers actually not even just frequently, but usually describe whatever type of meat they've harvested as something else in market. Um, and this question specifically asked about primate meat, but what we found was that, you know, there rarely wasn't any rhyme or reason. And so hunters admit to 
often usually disgu disguising primate meat as another type of meat to sell it in market. And this is a really big concern because it sort of subverts this idea of informed consent, you know, particularly if we know that community members are aware of zoonotic risks, the awareness of those risks from consuming bushmeat and the awareness of these zoonoses means that they can take the appropriate steps to sort of defend themselves against infection through hand washing, through cooking thoroughly. Um, and we know that they have, based on those other findings, sort of differential um, awareness and differential um, perception of zoonotic risk based on different groups. And without knowing what they're handling, without knowing what they're consuming, these people, these women especially, no longer have sort of this informed risk and informed consent um, and the ability to sort of protect themselves from these pathogens. So we'll move forward just a little bit. Um, and so picture here is our study area um, in Gregius Murchison Falls National Park which is continuous with Bugungu Wildlife Preserve and Kuruma Falls Wildlife Preserves to form the Murchison Falls Conservation Area. And the areas that are outlined in green, just north of this protected area, are the sub-counties from Noya District. These are where we conducted the studies, but these are also where we sort of collected the samples that are used in the rest of this analysis. Um, so these large black circles were the general areas where we obtained the bushmeat samples and conducted the interviews in 2016 to 2017. And so in total, we collected 219 bushmeat samples from 21 different communities. Um, we subjected 58 of these to the 16S amplicon sequencing um, that we'll go on to talk about. Um, but 219 of these bush, bushmeat samples were sort of sent on for um, PCR analysis and sequencing um, for the mammalian tissue as well. And so, although we initially collected 229, we submitted 10 of those samples from the final analysis due to degraded tissue from excessive smoking. Um, and so, our consensus sequences ranged um, from 85 to 918 base pairs in length, um, and 34 different species were identified using NCBI BLAST, 40, 34 different mammalian species. Um, and so, Water buck was actually the most frequently identified. 31% of our samples identified to the um, genus and species level were identified as water buck, which is a type of large antelope that's really commonly consumed, um, which was really interesting. Um, so in total, 108, which is about 50% of our samples were antelope species, which is sort of consistent with our, our sort of initial preliminary results sort of asking about what were commonly consumed and largely it's sort of like rodent species like edible bushrat and antelope um, and warthog are, are sort of desirable um, high demand species. What is interesting is that only three of our samples were actually found to be um, the species that are legal to hunt, that those species that depredate the crops. Um, we had two olive baboons in our samples and one bush pig and we were sort of anticipating a higher number in our samples um, of, of these legally hunted species that maybe were passed off as a different kind of species, but there were only three in our, in, in our samples. 23 of these were actually found to be domestic species, and we're not exactly sure where that um, sort of came from, whether it was just sort of word was getting around that samples were being purchased and so they people submitted something, um, or whether, as we'll sort of talk about in this next slide, um, this sort of plays into some of the, the questions that we have in market. And so on this, it's a little bit of a, a busy graph, um, but what you can see on the, um, on the x-axis is what species were sort of reported as when we collected them. So at the time that we collected the samples, we asked what they were, they were reported to us. Those are represented on the x-axis. On the y-axis, what we, you know, in theory should see is um, a nice clean one colored bar corresponding. So, so on the y-axis are the molecular results from PCR sequencing, Sanger sequencing, and blasting those results. And you can see that these are kind of all over the place. Um, you know, we want to see one clean bar where, you know, rat corresponds to rat, buffalo corresponds to buffalo, bushbuck corresponds to bushbuck. Um, and that's actually not at 
all what we see. And it doesn't really even follow the pattern that we were sort of suspecting of uh, these high risk species being passed off as something lower risk or these species that are legal to hunt being passed off as something culturally desirable like antelope. But these results are really just all over the place. Um, and we had an overall discrepancy between sort of reported and molecular results um, of 28%. So nearly 30% of the samples that we obtained were sort of misrepresented um, in some way at the point of sale. Now we'll sort of, um, we'll, we'll sort of discuss this at the end, but um, what we'll move into is sort of our microbial analysis at this point. Um, and so of those 58 samples that I alluded to earlier um, about and, and the tissue condition, so whether it was freshly obtained or smoked um, when we collected the sample is sort of important in this downstream analysis. Um, and so 36 out of the 58 were smoked, 22% were fresh. Here's just a, simply another um, sort of representation of the data that we saw earlier, it's limited to the 58 that we sent off for um, 16S amplicon sequencing. Um, and so these are, this is sort of the breakdown of the species that we sent off for sequencing. Um, but what we ended up doing for analysis is breaking these down into sort of wildlife species groups. And so what, what these sort of came down to were antelope, warthog, rodents, primates, and then other wildlife, anything that didn't fit into those previous four categories. And so 58 samples were sent for 16S rRNA amplicon sequencing. Um, our raw sequencing data to recovered um, 13,300,000 sequences among those 58 samples. And then following processing in the program mother, we identified 3,400,592 unique sequences, um, which were then assigned to 34,500 operational taxonomic units or OTUs, which serve as a proxy essentially for genus. And so sequence counts per individual sample range anywhere from 1,900 to 160,000 sequences. 613 OTUs when sort of remained in our sample set when OTUs that comprise less than 0 0.0001 relative abundance mean among samples were removed, um, which left us with 58 samples that contain 613 OTUs for downstream visualization and analysis. And these, these um, sort of samples and OTUs represented 18 different bacterial phyla and 171 um, genera. And so the most abundant phyla that we found sort of included Firmicutes, Proteobacteria, and Bacteroidetes. Here are our alpha diversity indices, and we have sort of the most common measures of alpha diversity where um, a dot represents a single sample. And so alpha diversity is the measure of diversity within any individual sample, which is sort of represented by richness and evenness of communities. And so statistically significant differences were observed between fresh and smoked samples, with smoked samples demonstrating greater alpha diversity than fresh samples. And then here are the alpha diversity of samples by the wildlife species group, which you can sort of see on the right here. No statistical differences were noted in alpha diversity among these wildlife species groups. Now on this slide, we're visualizing the Shannon index of alpha diversity, which is represented in these violin plots, plots with the embedded box and whisker plots. And it's easier to appreciate here the differences in alpha diversity between the smoked and fresh samples. Um, again, the smoked samples demonstrated greater alpha diversity than the fresh samples. And so here are the wildlife species groups that didn't show differences. Again, differences here, higher alpha diversity in the smoked samples in the blue. Among our wildlife species groups, there were no notable differences. So beta diversity is the diversity noted between samples. Um, and bray curtis dissimilarity matrices were calculated and plotted using NMDS scaling to assist spatial clustering um, by the variables condition, so smoked versus fresh, and wildlife species group. And beta diversity was statistically significant between bushmeat sample condition based on the Adonis analysis of Bray Curtis dissimilarity values, um, but was not statistically different among wildlife species groups um, with a very borderline p value. Um, so NMDS ordination of the Bray 
plots of the very Curtis dissimilarity values also didn't reveal any overtly discernible patterns of clustering between fresh and smoked samples. Maybe you can appreciate that there's a little bit of clustering up near the top of this graph, um, but you can see that the smoked samples sort of are all over that plot. Likewise, you really can't see any distinct patterns among these observed wildlife species groups either. So we also looked at beta dispersion based on the variable sample condition and wildlife species group, which compare the beta diversity among samples to a group centroid. And no statistically significant difference in beta dispersion was noted between the fresh and smoked samples. Beta dispersion was statistically significant among the wildlife species groups. However, the group that demonstrated a difference was the primate group, uh, which has a sample of one. So we removed that group, reran the beta dispersion, and there was no statistical difference among these remaining groups of antelope, rodent, warthog, and other wildlife. We also looked at the relativized abundance of phyla among our samples, which is visualized here. So for Mikides, Proteobacteria and bacteroidetes dominated the microbiotic composition of the bushmeat, and these phyla contain the vast majority of commensal skin and gut bacteria and environmental bacteria, so this finding isn't very surprising. Um, 16S sequencing is reliable to the level of genera, um, essentially, which is the sort of proxy, um, the OTU is the proxy for this in this analysis, so we screened the recovered OTUs um, for genera that are included on the CDC and FDA select agents list, um, which represent the zoonotic bacterial pathogens of interest and impact for human infections. Um, what's notable in this is that um, five genera included in this list were identified. So 248 OTUs were characterized by Clostridium, 570 OTUs characterized by Staphylococcus, and 193 OTUs were characterized by Bacillus. Um, Mycoplasma and Burkholderia represented five OTUs and one OTU each respectively. And as we continue to sort of analyze this data set and prepare it for publication, we're going to further assess these abundances um, within these sort of groups and associations of these genera, um, particularly with respect to different species and handling conditions to sort of see where we can identify the greatest degree of risk. So in conclusion, we sort of discovered that our samples tended to have higher alpha diversity and low beta diversity. And this may be related to the fact that all the bushmeat samples included in the study live in similar environments and consume similar foods. So creating similar exposures um, and therefore a similar microbiotic composition. All the statistical differences that we noted were found to exist between sample condition rather than among wildlife species groups and smoke samples interestingly had greater alpha diversity, um, which was not expected. So smoking is used as both a preservation method and perceived by hunters and cooks to increase the safety of meat for consumption, which seems to be somewhat contradictory to our findings. There may be an inadequate smoking technique or high levels of contamination of bushmeat during handling um, on the way to its destination to a final consumer. Um, like we said, suboptimal storage um, suboptimal cold storage and um, sort of hygienic conditions. We detected the presence of bacterial DNA in these samples, but it's really important to consider that DNA is extremely stable. And so the presence of DNA doesn't necessarily confirm the presence of live bacteria, but these findings do warrant further investigation to determine the origin of this microbiota and whether these microbial profiles represent endogenous infections, environmental contamination, or spoilage. Several genera were included in the select agents list um, in our samples, and although we don't have the resolution to species level using 16S amplicon sequencing, this still raises some concerns. Um, for example, several clostridial species are of concern for human infections of massive consequence, and multiple of these routes of exposure and in in, in infection are present within the bushmeat handling chain. Um, additionally, the, both hunters and cooks in Uganda report being injured with regularity while dealing with bushmeat, either in hunting or preparation, and so we have this opportunity for infection. So the majority of our bushmeat samples were antelope, which is consistent with other studies similar to this examining bushmeat, um, and it's consistent with the reported preferences for meat of hunters in our study area. In our social science data we obtained from the hunters and cooks in this area, virtually no precautions are being taken when handling bushmeat in any capacity at any point in the chain. Um, and respondents identified bats and primates to be the highest risk for potential infection while ranking wildlife even less risk than domesticated animal species for being able to carry these diseases that humans can become infected with. And this perception is aligned with this narrative of bat framing where bats are considered responsible for many emerging zoonoses. But as we're sort of finding in new research, um, Research published in 2020 has indicated antelopes actually carry a greater complement of pathogens and microbiota than do bats for their species diversity. 
And so this narrative sort of creates a little bit of a problem in both directions as this lower perceived risk of infection associated with wildlife species like antelopes and warthogs may reasonably lead to less stringent precautions to prevent injury and contact with bodily fluids and tissues from these species where there may actually be no real decrease in zoonotic potential with these species. And although we didn't see major differences in microbiotic composition at the level of OTUs, the abundance of bacterial sequences recovered should be considered. So even if there is a low relative abundance for these pathogens of concern, that's still a lot, uh, that's still a lot of bacterial DNA and may yet be enough to be infective, um, especially with these differential infective doses um, and different routes of exposure. And this is particularly true of genera associated with sporadic sepsis cases, um, including wolf Wolfhacemonis, which has appeared somewhat frequently in our data and is not typically known to be a, a pathogen of human um, interest, but has come up several times in these sort of septic cases. So better understanding these patterns of bushmeat preference harvest and handling, as well as their bacterial composition and the social factors that drive the interactions between community members and these wildlife are really crucial to the development and communication of practical and effective preventative measures during handling, butchering, um, hunting, food preparation, um, and consumption in order to mitigate injury, exposure, and infection, and ultimately the emergence of these pathogens. My references are here, and please feel free to email me. Um, I'm not here for that live q and I'm so sorry, um, but please feel free to email me at either one of these email addresses. This is a link to my ORCID ID, um, which has two of the papers from this study published. Thank you guys so much for joining. All right, thanks so much, uh, Dr. Dell. And again, you know, she apologizes for not being here. Um, I didn't, we, we have just maybe two minutes for questions. We're running over a little bit, but we'll still make a kind of our time frame. I didn't know if, uh, Marcy Souza or Adam Wilcox are available for questions if anybody has any, since I know they were a part of this study. Um, if we don't have any questions, we will move on. Just looking. I mean, I guess I guess I have do I do have one question, and I don't know. I see uh, Adam, you're there at least. Um, you know, with the bacterial di diversity indices, where she mentioned the scoped is higher than the fresh. I was wondering. I just had a kind of a lot of thoughts on that, but. Uh, I was wondering if um, the one index where it seemed to be the strongest was one that includes, it was uh, Shannon, which includes evenness. And I'm wondering if it's not necessarily increased richness, but increased evenness where potentially smoking reduces one particular bacterial species from overgrowing and actually promotes then kind of more diversity in the meat evenness wise. I don't know if that's something thought about. So, so Dr. Hardman, I'm pretty sure that this is um, your area of specialty in terms of biodiversity of, <laughs> of microbiome. So I'm honestly um, not sure because it definitely was not what we expected, but um, you know, it may be a matter of if the meat is already smoked, they're less careful with handling it because they think that stuff won't grow on it. But maybe as you said, it does allow for very specific types of bacteria to grow in that environment. Um, I'm honestly not sure that I think that one kind of all made us go, hmm, that's, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah. I'd, I'd refer that direct to Bree because I think she's got some good ideas. This is some, uh, um, this is some later analysis, uh, so I haven't I mean, seen a lot of this stuff yet, so I was, I was kind of um, interested and it was unique to me as well. <laughs> 